I want, I want us to do something. And there is a purpose for this. And it's going to really, I don't know if this is going to be on, I don't know if they're streaming this tonight or not. I know the women can handle this. But the men in here are probably too macho. They're going to say, I'm not doing that. That's silly. Okay. But there is a purpose in it, so I want everybody to do it if you can. I am going to give you a sentence, and I'm going to stop. It's one that some of you will know. And I'm going to stop, and then I want y'all in unison to finish it. We got it? Ready? I know Linda can do it. She never forgets anything, right? Here we go. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. Now, next question. How many of you have heard that in the last week? Would you raise your hands? No hands. You've heard it in the last, not sure, sometime. In, how about the last month or the last year? A couple have heard it in the last year. Linda's the only one in here that I could, I'm not going to ask her because I know she'll do it and it'll embarrass all the rest of you. I could say, Linda, when did you hear this last? She would tell us what date it was and would tell us what the weather was that day. And the time of day she heard it, yeah. Uh, Y'all think I'm kidding about that, but I used to not believe it. And I'd get Jay on the side and I'd say, Jay, did, is this when that really happened? He'd say, yeah, <laughs> that's when it really happened. I'd say, okay. <laughs> Y'all remember that. And you remember it because it's poetry. It's Poetry. Do you realize, I know we, we mentioned this in the equip class, I think, I don't really remember what I, <laughs> what I said in the equip class, um, but 30% of our Old Testament is Hebrew poetry, 30%. Now, I didn't count them, that's just what I've read, and I assume that's true. So Why? Why would God inspire his writers and his prophets and the other people to write in Hebrew poetry? Because they can remember it and they're not writing it down. They don't have copy machines. They don't have computers to type on. The people that are writing it are having to do it on a scroll. They're having to dip their quills in ink that they generally made themselves to write on. And we may have a couple of people in here that learn to, to write with a pen, dipping in an inkwell and writing, right? You didn't do that, did you, Larry? Your quill, okay. He had the quill, okay. <clears throat> and we're not going to talk about it, uh, poetry specifically tonight, but I want to, I mentioned this um, in the equip class when we did the thing on Jeremiah. And uh, I just want to point it out. I learned something last night. Uh, I didn't realize and have not said it, but if you've got a Bible, turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. We're not going to, we're going to look at the, uh, the first four verses. What I want you to, we've got, I think, maybe the first four verses will show up up there in a minute. Maybe they won't. I don't have any idea. <laughs> oh, there's verse 1. Okay. Now, what... What I, I'm, we're going to read the first four, four verses. This is not part of the message, but I want you just to look. If you have a paper printed Bible, look at verses one through four and just see if the text looks different on verse five. Do you see an indented text on verse five? Yeah. Some of you do. Uh, yeah, with or without quotation. Some will have quotation, some won't. But is it indented? It is indented. Uh, if you're, and this is what I learned last night. If you're using the YouVersion app, 
if you're using a Bible app that's called Step, and I don't know what apps you're using on your uh, phones or your tablets, but most of those apps, the, only, the ones that I've seen, except for Logos, which is free, by the way, except for that one, they don't indent. You won't see that little indentation on those passages. That indentation is indicating that it's Hebrew poetry. Okay? Yours is indented? Good. And what? What program? It's what? U verse? U version? Because U version doesn't do that on mine. Does anybody else have U version in here and it's working? And do you see the indentation? Quotation marks, but it's not indented. Uh, look at, uh, well, let me give you another. Look at verse, is the quotation marks just because God is talking? Or is it Hebrew poetry? Look, um, if you turn, let's try to find a place where it's not. Look in chapter 2 of Jeremiah. Uh, well, let me find it. Maybe it's finding a place where I know it's not God speaking. Um, I think chapter 9, probably. Uh, look at chapter 9. First three verses in chapter nine, is that indented? Or are they quoting because Jeremiah is speaking? It's not indented, okay. Um, well, uh, on the phone or the book, it's in the book it is probably, right? But on the phone is it? Okay, but you don't have them indented, right? Yours is indented on a tablet or phone? In your Bible, okay. Well, what, what I noticed last night for the first time is that they don't always, the indentation on the apps on phones and tablets is not always there. And I assume it had to do with how the editors sent, the, sent it to those people that built the apps and using little tabs or strange characters to indent it, and they may not have been able to do that. So, but in your Bibles, if you have a modern translation in your Bible, I brought a, I have the CSB that we're going to be using tonight, but I also brought a, a New American Standard 95 edition, very small print, but you can look at it and see it's indented. But if you're looking at these prophets, and we started with Isaiah, the last one, we just finished Isaiah, we're going into Jeremiah, and we're going to be going through the, the uh, minor prophets later. And you'll notice a whole lot of it is in Hebrew poetry. So people are going to be able to remember that, just like y'all remembered uh, Mary had a little lamb. Uh, they will be able to remember that. They don't have to write it down. They don't have to uh, take the time or get somebody to do it. They're going to remember it. And you read these people in the New Testament, people like Paul or Jesus or Matthew, any of these people that are quoting the Old Testament. And, you know, when you just think about, they had scrolls. They didn't have a book like we have that turns pages. They had scrolls. And some of those scrolls were like 30, 40 feet long. So what if you have somebody that says, okay, and they didn't have chapters. You realize that? There were no chapters and no verse numbers. And so when they open up to a passage in Isaiah, they've got to remember what part of Isaiah it's in and turn that thing till they get to it. They can't look at chapter 60 in Isaiah, chapter 53 in Isaiah. It's, they've got that in their head, where this is in the Bible, where it is in the book of Isaiah. And it's so embarrassing, our lack of biblical knowledge compared to what those people had in the first century. It's, it's shocking. Um, I remember one time being asked to uh, open my Bible or to come read the Great Commission. And my mind went blank. Where in the world is that? 
I know it's in the got to be in the Gospels, but which one? Right. So you know we're just so far removed from the what they knew in the New Testament and their their understanding of the Old Testament. But what I was going to show is that you know you can look and you see this Hebrew poetry, unless in my case if I'm looking at my phone, if I'm using the YouVersion app, I cannot tell uh, that it's indented. If I'm using the Logos Bible app, I can tell it's indented. If I'm using a CSB or an ESV translation, if I use, a, I think, the New American Standard, I can't see it. But if I open up a New American Standard, I will see it. So sometimes it's good to use a paper Bible to be able to see those kinds of things. But let's look quickly at, at uh, I want to talk about just quickly the background uh, when we when we look at when we look at prophets, it's very important to understand what's going on at that time frame in their world. What is what is their culture doing? We're going to look at at a temple sermon in just a moment, and it will make a whole lot more sense if we understand a little bit of the background. But notice uh, in the first four verses, or maybe the first three verses, we'll read in, in Jeremiah chapter one. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests living in Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. He also came throughout the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. So he's starting in the 13th year of Josiah, the 13th year of Josiah. Do you remember anything about Josiah? Eight years old when he became king. And what, you, what you're going to see as you go through, you know, we start Jeremiah tomorrow in our reading plan. What you're going to see in Jeremiah are dates over and over and over again. You're going to run into dates. And you will notice, and I know we mentioned it in the equip class, Jeremiah is not chronological, and that causes some issues. But it's just not chronological. I, I don't know why it's not chronological. I hadn't figured that out yet, but it's just not in chronological order. So you will be jumping around occasionally historically, but Jeremiah gives you a whole lot of dates. And Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Jeremiah is called in his 13th year. So how old is Josiah when Jeremiah is called to be a prophet? 21. Jay had that figured out for you before you mask him. He knew that. Jay's good with math, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, well, when you, Josiah was one of the Good kings. He was the last good king of Judah. Prior to him, the good king prior to him was a man named Hezekiah, who was prophet during Isaiah's reign. That's going to become significant in just a moment. Notice a couple of other things that are mentioned here. Um, Jeremiah's age is not given. He does mention in verse chapter 1 that he's a child. Uh, the Hebrew word could be anywhere from a newborn, three months old, to somebody that's 18, 17, or 18 years old. Could be maybe 20. Um, some people even have him a little older than that. But he's a, he's a young man. He's going to be approximately the same age as Josiah. Anybody, you probably don't know this, but Jeremiah lived until uh, he was 39 years of age. He reigned for 31 years. You go back into 2 Kings and you'll read that. So he died when he was 39. Now Jay, when Jay reads his Bible, these things go into him. They just lock in. And he sees these things later. <laughs> Look at, at um, chapter 25 and verse 3 of Jeremiah. We're going to have to hurry here. Jeremiah 25, 3 rather than me turning to it. They, they've got it up there. Jeremiah 25, 3 uh, says, From the 13th year of Josiah, king, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, 23 
years, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed. So let's think about that. Thirteenth year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, he's preached. Thirteenth year of Josiah, when was that? We just read about it. That was the day that Jeremiah was called. He was called in the 13th year of Josiah. So Jeremiah is saying, from the time I was called to preach God's word, I have preached, I've spoken to you time and time again, and you have not obeyed. Now, if you did a little arithmetic, we're not going to have to do this, the arithmetic, because we could, they don't, they don't have it upstairs, but if you looked in chapter 25, verse 1, you would find out he gives a very good explicit date for that in chapter 25, verse 1. It's what? The fourth year of Jehoiakim. That doesn't mean anything to y'all, does it? We're going to read one more verse. And then it's going to, maybe it still won't mean anything, but it might. Look at, at, uh, at chapter 46 and verse 2. Jeremiah says, About Egypt and the army of Pharaoh, Necho, Egypt's king, which was defeated at Carchemish Kark- on the Euphrates River by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in the fourth year of Judah's king, Jehoiakim, son of Josiah. The fourth year year of King Jehoiakim. Babylon defeats Egypt. When when Josiah begins, there are two world powers in the Middle East. One is Assyria and the other is Egypt. Assyria and Egypt become allies, which is hard to believe, but they became allies. Egypt went to help Assyria against Babylon, who was a new kingdom coming up. When Babylon is is actually winning battles against Assyria, Egypt goes to help Assyria out, and Josiah, King Josiah, decides, I don't want Babylon to be defeated because he's having to pay tribute to Assyria, having to pay tribute to Egypt. He didn't know about Babylon. So he takes his army up to stop Egypt from helping Assyria, and he's killed. When you read that account in Kings or you read it in Chronicles, what you don't read is Josiah going to the Lord and say, Lord, should I do this? You don't see him going to Jeremiah the prophet either. But this fourth year of Jehoiakim is the year when Babylon defeats not only Assyria, also Egypt, and it's 605 B.C. A lot of things are going to happen from that, from 605 B.C. In fact, there are one, two, three, four passages in the book of Jeremiah that will, and they're different. They're like in chapter 25, 36, 45, and 46 that will mention the fourth year of Jehoiakim. So it's, it is quite a, a, a eventful thing that's taking place. Look at Jeremiah 7.1, because that's what our, this is where our message comes from tonight. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. This is Jeremiah's uh, message at the temple. Uh, it's also found in, in uh, chapter 26, a summary of it in chapter 26. In 26, it's dated. Um, into the first years of Jehoiakim's reign. It's probably very close to this fourth year of Jehoiakim, this time when Babylon is coming uh, to power. And he says in in verses 1 to 11 in chapter 7, this is a word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the house of the Lord and there call out this word. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who enter through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Correct your ways and your actions, and I will allow you to live in this place. 
Do not trust deceitful words, chanting, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Instead, if you really correct your ways and your actions, if you act justly toward one another, if you no longer oppress the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, and no longer shed innocent blood in the place or follow other gods, bringing harm on yourselves, I will allow you to live in this place, the land I give to your ancestors long ago and forever. But look, you keep trusting in deceitful words that cannot help. Do you still murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods that you have not known? Then do you come and stand before me in this house that bears my name and say, we are rescued so we can continue doing all these detestable acts? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I too have seen it. This is the Lord's declaration. A hundred years earlier, from a, just a uh, concept here, a hundred years earlier, we had Hezekiah and we had Isaiah. And remember, Hezekiah got sick, thought he was going to die. And he wanted more time, and Isaiah prayed for him, and God gave him more time. And then a delegation from Babylon came to Jerusalem to see King Hezekiah and wish him well and tell him how grateful they are that he's survived this. And you remember what happened? Hezekiah said, let me show you all my gold. Let me show you all my silver. Let me show you the, the value in my kingdom. And he takes them into the temple and he shows them all of his riches. And then Isaiah shows up. And he said, who, who are these guys that you've just been talking to? And he said, oh, those, those are buddies of mine. They're from Babylon. But what did they see? I showed them everything, all my wealth. Remember what Isaiah said? There's going to come a time when all your wealth is going to be taken into Babylonian captivity. This is over 100 years earlier, but the people know about it. Babylon has now come on the scene. Babylon has now defeated Assyria and Egypt. So what is the situation going to be like? Um, it's a time... When he's preaching this sermon to the temple, it's the time when there is a potential crisis. People don't know what's going to happen. It's a time of uncertainty. We live in a time of uncertainty today. People today are worried about the coming election. It's hardly anywhere you go today that somebody doesn't bring up the election, and what's going to happen. And it doesn't matter. You know, you can, if depending on how many people you talk to and which direction they are, you can get the thing, oh, what's going to happen if Trump gets elected? And somebody else will say, what's going to happen to the country if a Kamala gets corrected? Democracy's ruined. They both sides say that. What's going to happen? It's a time of crisis, isn't it? People don't know. They're uncertain about the future. We're uncertain about foreign nations. What's Russia doing? What's China going to be doing? What's Iran doing? Do we need to be concerned about these things? What about North Korea? Do we need to be concerned about? It's a time when there is concern in America. We're concerned over the economy. We're concerned over crime. We're concerned over, in my case, the moral decay of our nation. Some are really worried about global warming. It's a time of uncertainty in America today. It was a time of uncertainty when Jeremiah is speaking to these people. They don't know what's going to happen. Well, let's look at the audience that's in, that he's talking to here in verse 1 and 2. This is the word that came to Jeremiah the Lord. Stand in the gate of the house of the Lord 
And there call out this word, hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who went through these gates to worship the Lord. Who are these people that he's preaching to? It's the people that are going to the house of the Lord. That's who he's talking to. It would be like if he were to come here today, he would be t- talking to the church. He's talking to the people that are religious. It mentions here that he talks to him in the gate of the court. There's a question about that. I, you know, in, in the um, second temple, the one we normally call Herod's temple, we know all about the gates that are around it and so forth. There's archaeological information and so forth. Solomon's temple is not that way. Solomon's temple we know when you read about it in Second Chronicles, about the only thing you see is they're coming in from the east, which makes sense. So we know there's a gate on the east. Uh, and I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but uh, and I, if they'll pause this clock, I'll give you this real quick. The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden, they are run out, Adam and Eve run out of the Garden of Eden. There's cherubim there, and the cherubim are controlling the, so they can't get back in. What side are they on in the Garden of Eden? Where are the cherubim? On the eastern side. Tabernacle. They build a tabernacle. When they build the tabernacle, which direction is the entrance to the tabernacle? East. What do you find in the tabernacle, in the, the drawings that are there in the tabernacle? What are the, the uh, embroidery that's on the, the curtains and the carvings that are on everything. What do you find? You find things like uh, cherubim. You find things like pomegranates. You find things like palm trees. What's it look like? It looks like a garden. God was present in the Garden of Eden. In the tabernacle, He's now separated from the people because they can't be in near a holy God, but his presence is seen to be in the tabernacle. It's like a Garden of Eden. You go to the temple. They build, Solomon builds his temple. What did it look? Where was the opening to the temple? East. Same type things going on. The tabernacle and the temple was seen to be the actual presence of God with the people. So they're religious people, appear to be religious people. Um, you know, they, they're religious folks. The question is, were they there because of their devotion to the Lord? Were they driven there by a crisis? Why are the people there? There's a crisis going on. Is that why the people have come? When we go back to um, the days, uh, 9-11, 2001, people started flocking the churches. Why did they do so? Is it to get close to the Lord or was it the crisis that was there? Um, Were they driven by tradition or habit? Do you know that back in uh, the days of COVID, churches shut down everywhere? Some were forced by the government. Some just did it out for safety for their people in the church. And they started streaming, started putting the church services online. Our church did that. A lot of people started going to that. Do you know there are still people? I have, uh, (laughs) I don't know whether, I'm not going to, mention a name, but I have a person in my family that's not one of my children or not one of my grandchildren that didn't go to church during COVID. They don't live here, by the way. They didn't go to church during COVID, and they have not set foot in a church since. They watch it online. We have people in our church that are on our church rolls that have not been back in church since COVID. I want to, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because y'all are in the church, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how many times recently I've talked to someone, and sometimes it's a member of our church, sometimes it's not a member of our church, and they've told me 
that they came in to our church and they felt the Spirit of God. They, I felt the Spirit of God Sunday when I was in that church. I want to ask you a question. How many times have you felt the Spirit of God when you watched in the living, went in the living room and turned on the TV to watch the program? Enough said. You, you get information about the church, you hear a sermon, you can take some notes, but I'll, you will not feel the Spirit of God in your living room like you're going to feel it when you come to worship service. The next thing I want us to look at is misplaced trust. And we'll have to hurry. Je Jeremiah 7, 4 and 10, 10 to 11, or 10 and 11. Jeremiah 7, 4 says, Do not trust deceitful words, chanting, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Go down to verse 10. Then do not come and stand before me in this house that bears my name and say, we are rescued so we can continue doing all these detestable acts. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I too have seen it. This is the Lord's declaration. They were trusting in the temple of the Lord. We are safe because God is present in this temple. And because he's present in the temple, we don't have to worry about Babylon. We don't have to worry about anything else because God is here with us. What do people trust in today? Some people will trust, you know, it's, in Jesus' day, you can remember in Jesus' day, Jesus would talk to them and they said, hey, we're, we're of Abraham's seed. We're of Abraham's seed. We're Jews. We're descendants of Abraham. We are safe. You remember what Jesus said? God can raise up children of, Israel from, of Abraham from these rocks. You are not safe because you are a child of Abraham or a Jew. So what do people trust in today? Some trust in money. A lot of people trust in money. We're okay because we, we got plenty of money. We don't have to worry about depression. We don't have to worry about the stock market because we, we got plenty of money. We're okay. Jesus had a parable about a rich fool in the Gospel of Luke. You probably remember it. Some people today trust in themselves. They're good people. You can ask somebody someday, sometime about their salvation or how they are with God. Oh, God's going to take care of me because I'm good. I'm so much better than Joe over here. That won't, that won't work. Trusting in yourself. A lot of people will trust in themselves. Some people trust in their church membership. Are you safe? I'm a member of First Baptist Church, Hickory West. Yeah, that wasn't the question. You know, it's almost political now. You know, you can ask some of these politicians, you ask questions to, they never answer them. They just divert the subject to something else. Uh, this happens also in Christianity. Are you saved? Well, I'm a member of First Baptist Church. That wasn't the question. Do you know Jesus? Well, I'm a member of First Baptist Church, Hickory West. That wasn't the question. The question is, do you know Jesus? Do you, is he Lord of your life? Some people will, will um, trust in their baptism. Are you saved? Are you going to heaven when you die? You know the Lord? I've been baptized. Wasn't a question. Wasn't a question. Some people will say, I remember a day when I asked Jesus to come into my heart, I, I prayed the sinner's prayer. Do y'all, anybody here know who J.D. Greer is? Nobody. He's a Southern Baptist. 
we'd had some over here that know who J.D. Greer is. Southern Baptist preacher um, in Durham, Raleigh, North Carolina, and the East. Summit Church. He preaches to over 11,000 people a week. It's not a little church. He wrote a book and also had some sermons that are available on the YouTube, by the way. I haven't listened to him on YouTube, but I have. I don't know if I read this in the book or if I heard him preach it. But he wrote a book and he has a sermon called Stop Asking Jesus into Your Heart. That sounds, well, that's crude, isn't it? Stop asking Jesus into your heart. But that's what he said. And the reason he said it was he claims, I don't think there is one, but he claims he holds the Guinness World Record for asking Jesus to come into his heart. He asked Jesus to come into his heart. Okay, I'm saved. And something happens in his life. And, oh, I've got to ask Jesus to come into my heart. And he claims he has the record. I don't know. I don't remember how many times he said he had. It's a great little video uh, series, preaching series. It's on First John, by the way, uh, is the, the book that he's, that he's expounding on. So what do you trust in? Do you trust in a prayer? Or do you trust in a relationship that you have with Jesus? That's the question. These people were trusting in the temple. The last thing that I want to mention here is in chapter 7, verse 3, and verse 5 and 6 of the, uh, of the text, and that is that repentance is required. Everybody realizes that, right? Repentance is required for salvation. He said in verse 3, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, correct your ways and your actions, and I will allow you to live in this place. In verse 5 and 6, he says, instead, if you really correct your ways and your actions, if you act justly toward one another, if you no longer oppress the resident alien, the fatherless, the widow, no longer shed innocent blood in this place, follow other gods, bringing harm on themselves, I will allow you to live in this place, the land I gave to your ancestors long ago and forever. You have to correct, it says here in the CSB. Your translation may say amend. Yours may say reform. One of the things that, and you know, it's um, uh, translations do the best they can trying to take a Hebrew word and bring it into English, and and sometimes it's difficult. But the basic meaning of the Hebrew word that's used there, that's translated here as correct and amend, maybe a reform in your translation, is good. G O D. So if we were to read it that way, Jeremiah is saying to good your ways and your actions. I'm going to get in trouble with all the teachers, I know. You can't, can't say stuff, jail say, you can't say stuff like that. Good your actions and your deeds. Repent. Repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. After John was arrested, John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news, proclaiming the gospel of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent. 
What does repent mean? Change of direction. It's turning and changing a direction. A lot of people will hold that uh, they, they see, and there's a bit of sorrow that's probably with that also, uh, with repent, but a lot of people will say when they're caught, you, know, you hardly ever find somebody in jail that's not sorry he committed that crime that got him in jail. There might be a few, but most of them not really happy about the fact they got caught. So are they repenting? No. They are sorry they committed that sin, but they're not repenting. Repenting is being sorrow and turning. Sorrow and turning. You know, sorry for your sin and sorry enough to do something about it. Good, Richard. Uh, we have those types of, of issues. And this man that we're reading about tonight was fully aware of what it takes to be a child of God. It's not just I mean, you know, we've all known people, and, and I'm sure you've known a, a whole lot of people that have um, come to church, they've walked down an aisle, they've confessed their faith in Christ, and they've gone out, and they have lived pretty well for a short period of time. And then they fall back into whatever they were doing. That is not repentance. Repentance can become a lifestyle. I've, I know I've told this story a number of times, but we had a former church that I was in. We had a had an individual that was on his deathbed. They really believed he was on his deathbed. He believed it. The hospital believed it. The doctors believed it. And I went to see him. And he told me in the hospital room, if God will raise me up. If God will let me live, I will be faithful to Him from now on. And he's bargaining with God. And God raised him up. It seemingly was a miracle because doctors didn't give him any hope. Nurses didn't give him any hope. But he was raised up. And he started coming to church every time the doors were open. Sunday school, church service. In those days, you had training union. Anybody old enough to remember that? So <laughs> training union, he's there. Worship service on Sunday night, he's there. Wednesday night service, he's there. Revival service, he's there every night. And he continued it for about seven or eight months. And then he quit. He didn't make it the rest of the year. A horse kicked him. And he ended up dying. We, we worship a God that is truly in charge. It's better not to make a promise and flippantly with God, God, you heal me and I'll do this. Don't do it, folks. He may hold you to it. It may hold you to it. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your word. We thank you. Thank you for your prophet. We just ask that you would continue to bless this church and everything that we do. We pray for, for Daniel's voice. We just ask that you'd continue to work in him and heal him. We thank you for bringing him as our pastor. We pray that, that you'd be with Dave as he's on vacation this week and guide and direct everything that he does and Help us to be what you'd have us to be. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.